today as we come to the table. If you make good choices, then you're going to be beautified in the hands of the potter, and that is the Lord. So our character is shaped, our life is shaped, the consequences long term are shaped, and it's amazing for those of us now that have lived for a while, you don't realize how much those decisions you made in the teen years affect you when, you're, when you get older. It's amazing. And you look back and think, I can't change that now, but I can change it from this point on. So the bad news is we can't change what we've already done. The good news is we can start right now reforming and reshaping what we have from this point on. The, the good news for you guys that are young, you can shape your future right now by your obedience to the Lord and watch God do amazing things in your life. like a potter molds clay over and over into a beautiful vase. So does our Heavenly Father mold us over periods of difficult times to become a beautiful Christian. We have to go through hardships. We have to go through a literally fire to become all we are meant to be by God's eyes. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. In today's message, Pastor Mark will remind you that no matter what choices you've made through those difficult times, there is still opportunities to make better ones and allow the Lord to turn your life around for the better. No matter how far you are from the Lord, He will find you and accept you with love. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Judges, chapter 16, with today's edition of Come to the Table. Awesome. If you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16, as we will finish looking at Samson. And depending on how well 16 goes, we may go on and get to see um, the whole story of uh, Micah and, and the, Dan the Danites getting settled up there in that region and all that goes with that. So a lot of exciting stuff. We'll see how far we get. But Judges chapter 16, let's pray. I want to ask God, as always, to bless it. And so let's do that right now. Father, we do pray you would open up your word to us as we finish looking at this amazing life story of Samson and just hearing his life story, Lord, and seeing the mistakes he made, the things he did right, which were very few actually, and, and yet you still used him in great ways and all the things, Lord, that he did wrong, that he suffered greatly for, and still you were faithful all the way through till the end. What a great God you are. And Lord, we know you'll be faithful to us as well. And so I pray you bring your word alive to us through the life of Samson and uh, those that we're going to look at beyond that. But just again, speak to us, minister by your Holy Spirit what you want to say to your people. Lord, we're all ears. Have your way with us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Samson, tragic story in many ways. You know, if Samson had just had his life together spiritually, he would have been one of the greatest leaders in Israel's history. Now think about that. I don't say that lightly. When you think about the amazing supernatural ability that God gave to Samson, if he had had that supernatural strength and that supernatural ability and it had the heart of a Samuel or the heart of a John the Baptist or a heart of an Elijah, think of how God could have used him. Think of how he would have gone down in history. Now, we know of Samson. He's gone down in history, and we all know his name. Even unbelievers know the name Samson. Why? Because of his supernatural strength. But can you imagine if Samson had just truly lived for God the way God could have used him in the short 20 years that he led the nation of Israel? It would have been unbelievable. And so it's very sad to me to see uh, the potential of Samson, and yet because of Samson, Samson's uh, foolish choices— much of his life was wasted. You know, it's, it's been said that choices mold a character. So every choice you make is, is like the sculptor. You know, it's like the person that's got the clay on the wheel and they're turning the wheel. And every choice you make shapes a little bit more of what you're turned into. If you make bad choices, you're going to be a little bit more lopsided. There'll be more, you know, more areas where it doesn't look right. But if you make good choices, then you're going to be beautified in the hands of the potter and that is the Lord. So our character is shaped, our life is shaped, the consequences long term are shaped, and it's amazing for those of us now that have lived for a while, you don't realize how much those decisions you made in the teen years affect you when, you're, when you get older. It's amazing. And you look back and think, I can't change that now, but I can change it from this point on. So the bad news is we can't change what we've already done. 
The good news is we can start right now reforming and reshaping what we have from this point on. The, the good news for you guys that are young, you can shape your future right now by your obedience to the Lord and watch God do amazing things in your life. Samson made bad decisions. He was a man that was led by his flesh. We saw that he was a womanizer. We saw that he probably was a drinker because of hanging out at the vineyards, and God had told him to stay away from the vineyards of Timnah. Uh, we saw that his life was led by the desires of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, rather than being led by the Spirit. And now we come to literally the last chapter of Samson's life, uh, where we take up here in 16, and we're going to see the tragic end, although again, as we said, God will be faithful to Samson all the way till the end. And this is probably one of the most famous stories in Samson's life. Again, people that uh, you know of Samson, they know mostly of Samson and Delilah. And he said, yes, I, 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 I get that. Uh, I remember the little kid that one time uh, called him, uh, what was it, Handsome and Delilah or something. I think they called it. I thought that was cute. But this is Samson and Delilah. And um, notice what it says in chapter 16, verse 1. Now, Samson went to Gaza. You guys know where Gaza is, still there today. The Gaza Strip, it's known for being a really, even today, it's, it's a really crazy place. And the question you have to ask before we even read any further is why was he going to Gaza? Because he was always going places he shouldn't be going Samson was hanging out in places he shouldn't have been hanging out. Warning number one, when you hang out in places you shouldn't be hanging out, bad things will happen. It's just reality, okay? If you're watching things you shouldn't watch, you're going to plant things in your heart that shouldn't be planted. If you're listening to things you shouldn't listen to, you're going to plant seeds in your heart through your ears that you don't want planted. If you go places that you know bad things happen, don't go there. Um, and so he goes to Gaza. There's no sense in him going to Gaza. He's a Jew. He's not a Gazite. And uh, he doesn't need to be there. There's nothing good in Gaza. And yet notice while he's there, exactly what you think would happen happens. He sees something bad. He sees a harlot. Samson was always looking at women. His eyes were a weakness. Women were a weakness. And what is he, you know, it's like you go back to the first of Samson's life. He tells his dad, I've seen a woman, you know. And that's when the trouble began, right, <laughs> for Samson. Uh, it's a good thing to see the right woman, but it's a bad thing to see the wrong woman. And now he sees the wrong woman again, a harlot, a prostitute, we would say. And he sees a harlot there, and he goes into her. So, again, when you're living the life of the flesh, and you go to a place you're not supposed to go, when the door opens to do something wrong, guess what you do? You do it. That's what the flesh does. So Samson, if he hadn't put himself in that position, he wouldn't have ended up with a prostitute. But Samson wanted to put himself in that position because he was driven by the flesh. And when the Gazites were told, Samson came back, by the way, Gazites and all this, that region were the Philistines at this time. When the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. So now Samson, he sees these guys waiting on him. You know, he, somehow he knows they're there. And he saw, he's, he's in this prostitute's house. He realizes he's been surrounded by the Gazites, if you will. They're waiting at the gate. They know he's got to go out that way. They were quiet all night saying in the morning when it's daylight, we'll kill him. And apparently they, they went to sleep because notice it says in verse 3, And Samson lay low until midnight, and then he arose at midnight, so they must have dozed off, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city, two gateposts, pulled them up bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Now again, you got to realize what this is like. The gate of the city was what kept the enemies out. So imagine what this was made of. This wasn't a hollow core door. Okay, we're talking massive structure doors in that day, metal to hold them in place, solid wood, sometimes maybe covered in iron. He takes them literally off of the hinges, hundreds of pounds, puts this on his back, carries it to the top of the hill. Now, by the way, scholars argue about whether it was the nearest hill or the hill that was all the way facing Hebron. We don't know which one it was, but let me give you this first of all. The nearest hill facing Hebron was four miles away. So even if you want to take the easiest out, well, Samson didn't go that far. He only carried a few hundred pounds on his back for a four mile. This guy was a, was a beast, right? When God gave him his power and his strength. So either way, the other gate, the other hill that faced Hebron was 30 miles away. Most people believe he went to the one 30 miles away. So either way, this guy was a hoss when it came to God's spirit coming up, you know, having God's power. And what's amazing to me is, look, God gave him this. This is supernatural. And even in the midst of his sin, he was still operating in God's supernatural power. Do I understand the ways of God? Absolutely not. Does that mean God sanctions this? Absolutely not. But I do know this. God comes upon us with his spirit. He gives us certain gifts and anointings, and he will use those and keep them enacted up to a point. And then God says, I'm done. And I've seen people living in sin. God still anoints them. I knew of one pastor that I didn't find out till later he was living in sin, but had been living in sin for quite some time. 
And, and, and as he was living in sin, there were more people coming to the Lord in his ministry than he'd ever seen his entire ministry up to that point. Now, that makes me scratch my head. I'm like, how in the world, Lord, why in the world did you anoint this guy? And people coming to Christ while he's living in sin. And before that, when he wasn't living in sin, you didn't see that kind of fruit. Listen, God loves his flock. God loves his people. And anybody that will get up and share the word of God, God will use it. Even someone in sin, God can use. It doesn't justify it. And eventually, though, what God will do is God will remove the anointing and then judge what will fall on that person. They'll be exposed and they'll be done away with. But Samson here is still operating in this supernatural power, even though he's living in this sin, blatant sin against God. And that's, you don't hear much about that, those first three verses there, that one little scene, that probably is more of a snippet of probably several instances like that, maybe not carrying gates away, but again, because of Samson's propensity with women, probably the Holy Spirit showing us one of many of, of these situations that happened. And so just amazing. Notice verse 4, afterward it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Now, this is the first time we ever see Samson loved anybody. The first woman that he wanted to marry, he saw her and she was Vavavum right? Little Philistine filly, got his eye, drew him in. Oh, this is, this is dad. You got to get her for me. She's the one. And it was totally all the flesh, everything there. No, no relationship. As far as we can tell, just, he really, she drew him in and everything after that, he sees a woman, sees a woman, his eyes are drawn, goes to a prostitute. Now we come to Delilah and this one, it, he appears, he loved her again, m- m- hanging around the wrong type of women. Uh, again, Delilah's not going to turn out to be a very good person we're going to see here, but this is the consequence of getting linked up with those that are not really walking after the heart of the Lord. By the way, those of you that are, that are in the market, so to speak, for a husband or wife, make sure the person that you're attracted to is godly. It's not about money or looks. I mean, one day we stand before the Lord. You want someone godly. And I always encourage the ladies... Try to find a man that loves the Lord more than you do. Because what happens is after marriage, oftentimes you see the wife trying to drag the husband to church rather than him being the leader that God's called him to be. So if you start out with a leader before you're married and he's really leading, he's probably going to stay as a leader after you're married. And he's going to be leading you to the things of the Lord. You want someone pulling you closer to God. Now that doesn't mean that we as men shouldn't look for a godly woman that will also pull us close to the Lord. But again, it's just wisdom with the man being the leader that you want someone that's walking close with God. Now, Samson was not walking with the Lord, neither was Delilah. But here they are linked up. It says, and the lords of the Philistines, that is the rulers of these five regions of, of the Philistine areas, the, you know, the, the different er- regions and cities that were down there are regions, not cities, more regions. The Lord, they came up to her and they said to her, entice him and find out where his great strength lies. And by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him and afflict him, and every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, there's a lot to note here. First of all, again, I, I know people have different views about what Samson looked like. I think Samson was probably a, a fairly, he was probably a muscular guy, but I don't think he was like a Hulk. Because if he was this hugely muscular guy, they would have said, we know where his strength comes from. He's a, he's a Hulk. But they said, look, we don't know where this guy gets his strength. So try to find out where does his strength come from? It was the power of the Holy Spirit giving him this strength, giving him supernatural ability that was beyond himself. And and they go to her and they say, you know, let's find out how we can bind him, how we can afflict him. And if you do that, we'll give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So again, uh, attempting her with money. You know, you'll you'll have a good uh, bank account. We're going to load you up with a lot of cash. And so again, a lot of us, there's a lot of people that have weaknesses toward money. That's a, a weakness for a lot of people. This was something that attracted her attention greatly. And so Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. Now, I would, I would stop right there. You know, they say that love blinds you. If you're in a relationship with someone, they say, you know what, tell me how you can be destroyed. That should be a clue. Something's not right, right? Something's amiss, and it's her, and she's the wrong miss. You need to get to another one, Right? Because if she's wanting to destroy, why would she care about knowing that? Now, what's really sadly amusing, and amusing is the wrong word to use, but I, I, I don't know the word I'm looking for right now. As this progresses, she gets more and more blatant about it, and he just plays right along with it because he's always depended that God would pull him through, that God would do this. He's not going to find out till later that, no, there's a point where God says, I'm going to remove my anointing. 
I'm not going to let you be used the way you've been used before. Now you're going to fall into the hand of the enemy. I protected you up to a point, but now you're being foolish, and I'm going to allow you to fall into the hands of the enemy. So he's going to toy with this and play with this, thinking, you know, he can do all this thing. But again, here's the key. Notice this. I call this the Samson syndrome, and I, 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 I've seen this. When people go so far down the road in their sin, they just literally become blinded to the fact that it's wrong and that they're going to pay a consequence. And they actually believe that it's okay. God doesn't care. I'll never face anything for this, and it won't be that bad. God's got to forgive me, right? He's a God of love, and everything's going to be okay. And they, they get so blinded by it that you can't reach them. You can't show them. And they're so blinded, they literally, as the Bible says, they, just, they walk to their own slaughter. It talks about it in Proverbs. And this is where Samson is. Samson has become so blinded by this long-term compromise that now he can't see the truth anymore. And see, this is a warning to us. Here's how this works. And you guys have experienced this. The first time you sin, warning lights go off everywhere. Little yellow lights and all kinds of red and just like, ah, I shouldn't have done that. And then nothing really happens and you kind of look around. Hmm. I kind of enjoyed that. Nothing happened. Hmm. I'll try it one more time. And then a few lights go around again, but it's kind of a little, maybe a couple less, you know. Hmm. Finally, there's no little light circling warning you anything. It just becomes normal. You start living that way and you accept it. And you get to where you now you're blinded to it. And if someone says something to you, legalist, rather than, oh my goodness, how did I veer off so far from God's word? What happened to me? And it's a gradual, nobody, you know, nobody goes from being a faithful husband or wife to the next day adultery. It doesn't happen that way. It's a slow weakening of the relationship at home, and then a wandering of the eye and the heart, and then someone that gets your attention, and well, they don't love me anyway, and then the enemy gets involved, and this is a process that drags out. You become so blinded that next thing, boom, next thing you know, you're, you're there. And it's like, how did that happen? It happened gradual, back when all the lights were going off and all the swirlies and God saying, stop, stop, stop. That's when you've got to stop. Right then is when the decision has to be made. This is wrong, I can't do this. And if you make that decision at the moment that it happens, you're going to stay on target with the Lord. If you don't, you're going to become a Samson. And the problem is he's going to go from strength to, to total weakness and, and destruction of the enemy, as we're going to see. And now he's at the point where it's too late. Samson is, is already gone. He just doesn't know it yet. And Satan is moving in for the kill. He's already been, uh, you know, buttered up. He brought somebody in. They knew Samson. You know, Samson now loves this girl. She doesn't care anything about Samson. She wants the money. So she says, how can we afflict you and all this kind of stuff? And again, brother Samson saying, what is wrong with you? I, I don't want to see you anymore. Don't you care about me, you know? Samson said to her, well, he starts playing with it. Well, if they bind me uh, with seven fresh bowstrings, that is, you know, they're, they're, not, they're still green and they've not dried up or become crusty, uh, not yet dried, I shall become weak like any other man. So no doubt he's on the inside smiling, going, I'll play this game for a minute. She can't, she can't do anything to me. So the lords of the Philistines brought up seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound him with them. They obviously were superstitious or whatever because they knew he could break those. I don't know what they were thinking, but let's try it. And then, this is amazing. Look at this. And the men were lying awake, uh, lying in wait, staying with her in the room. Now, this must have been a large room. And where were they hiding in the room? I don't know. But, I mean, they're in the room with Samson. You know, sometimes the enemy can be right on top of us, and we don't even recognize it because we're so blinded by our sin. He's waiting to pounce, and we don't even notice it. This is where Samson is. They're literally in the room. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So they're testing it to see if this will work. What to watch what he does. But he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So it just fell right off his hands. So the secret of his strength was not known. And then Delilah said to Samson, look, you've mocked me and told me lies. You know, how can we build a relationship if you're not honest with me? <laughs> amazing, amazing how blind. He's like, I've mocked you? I told you how to do that. You actually tried it to see if you could bind me and hurt me? I mean, Samson's still not getting it. This is how blinding sin can be. Now, please tell me, what may you be bound with? I love you. You're supposed to love me. Tell me how I can destroy you. So he said to her, well, if they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I shall become weak like any other man. He's saying, I'll just be like any other man. And he keeps saying that phrase. Notice that. And, and, and soon he's going to be just like any other man. 
So here's the thing. When you walk with the Lord, you're not like any other man or any other woman. You have the power of God in your life. But when you live in sin, you become like any other man and become like any other woman. See, here's the thing that scares me about my flesh and about me. Times throughout my life where I've not been as close to the Lord as I am at other times, I can find myself, the old man, is start, he's still there. And I realize if I don't get back on track, I'm going to be just like I used to be, like any other man. You see, when we give our life to the Lord, we're born again, right? You have a new spirit. The spirit of God is in you. But guess what? The old person is still very much alive. You put it to death. And it's in there dead. And now you're living for the Lord. Whichever one you feed the most is the one that's going to thrive. If you're pouring into the things of the Spirit, you're going to be thriving in the things of the Spirit. If you're pouring in the Spirit but letting the flesh have a little bit of, you know, whatever, the flesh is going to be down there kind of waiting for its opportunity. And if the flesh takes over, now you're living totally by the flesh. Your spirit is just gone. I'm not talking about the loss of salvation. I'm talking about the deadening of the Spirit. But what happens is, if the flesh can rise up and take over, it will. So... This is something that is always there. We all have to be aware of. And Samson here, he's saying, I'll be like any other man. Well, he already was living like the world, but he's going to be like any other man in that he's not going to have God's help at all if he keeps on this path, which we know, is, which we know he will. So look, here's his second one he does, toying with it, just messing with it, getting right up to the edge of what it really is. And you'll notice each time he gets a little bit closer to what it is that will make him be weak. Therefore, Delilah took new ropes, bound him with them, and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And the men were lying in wait. They're staying in the room. But he broke them off his arms like a thread. And Delilah said to Samson, Until now you've mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. You know, you say you love me. This is so crazy. This story just kills me. Now we notice, he t- notice this. Now he actually goes, again, as we toy with sin, we get more and more compromising. Now he gets that first hint that it's something toward his hair. By the way, it wasn't his hair. It was his commitment to God. The hair represented the Nazarite vow and or the commitment to God. It wasn't about the hair. It's just what the hair represented, which was the connection he was literally going to cut between him and God in heart, represented physically by the hair. But now we see him toying with the very source of that commitment to God. Until now you've mocked me, he said, okay, if you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the looms. He's got his hair fixed in in seven locks is the way it is, it reveals here. And she wove it tightly. He he told her how to do it. Then she wove it tightly with the batten of the loom. Again, no doubt when he fell asleep. And said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he woke from his sleep, pulled out the batten from the web of the web from the loom. And she said again, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You've mocked me these three times and have not told me, you know, where your great strength lies. You, know, you wonder what happened after the first conversation. The, the Philistines, ah, there's no Philistines. Well, I was just seeing really if you would let me do that. Now, you didn't tell me the truth, you know. How can you really be done? Okay, well, if you take the seven fresh rows, whatever. Ah, where are the Philistines? Well, you don't love me. You're lying to me. What? Now he gets up. I mean, the loom, look, the way this worked is they had these wooden things. You slide back and forth when, you, when you're in the loom and you make, you know, things out of it with blankets whatever you know you slide the wood back and forth and those that do some of that you know yarn type thing we don't really use those so much today but you know how those how that works he's got one of those connected to his head you've just heard pastor mark teaching from the book of judges here on come to the table one of the most remarkable stories from judges is the story of gideon with just 300 men Gideon and the Israelites defeated an army of 135,000 Midianites. But it wasn't because Gideon was a military genius or because the Israelites had some new advanced weapon. It's because Gideon trusted and obeyed God. God fought for the Israelites and completely defeated the Midianites. To God, it doesn't matter if you have 10 men or 1,000 men on your side. And it doesn't matter who or how many are against you. If God is for you, then no one can stand against you. Don't trust in your own power and wisdom. Trust in God because the battle belongs to the Lord. If today's message had an impact on you, would you let us know by using our questions or comments link found on our website, thewaymedia.net? This is a good way for us to gauge how we can better serve you, our listeners. While you're there, stay a while. Familiarize yourself with our ministry and what we're about. Come to the Table is a ministry out of Calvary, Knoxville. If you find yourself traveling through, staying in, or residing in Knoxville, Tennessee, we hope you'll come check us out at Calvary, Knoxville. Consider that an invitation from us 
to you. We'd love to have you. Service times can be found at thewaymedia.net. Just scroll down and find the link to Calvary Knoxville. Well, that's all the time we have for you today, but we want to say thank you for listening. Pastor Mark has more in Judges, so join us again on the next edition of Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.